Peace be upon you. So if you're having a debate with someone, you want to use sources that they recognize. For instance, if I'm having a debate with a Christian, it wouldn't make sense for me to use the Quran in this debate because they don't recognize the Quran as a uh, divine scripture. It's better for me to use the New Testament. Similarly, if I'm having a discussion with a traditionalist who believes that the Hadith, the Sunnah, either are on par to the Quran or supersede the Quran, if I try to have this debate using the Quran alone, it's going to fall on deaf ears. And to put this in perspective, Al Shafi, who is the founder of the Shafi school of Sunni jurisprudence, argued that the Sunnah stands on equal footing with the Quran in authority, for the command of the Prophet is the command of God. Ibn Hanbal, who is the founder of the Hanbali school of Sunni jurisprudence, took this one step further and argued that the Quran needs the Sunnah more than the Sunnah needs the Quran. So if I'm talking to people who have this mentality, if I argue using the Quran alone, it's not going to pack as much of a punch. So God willing, in this episode, I want to look at 19 hadith that go against the sunnah. And the reason for doing this is to show that even by their own standard, their own book of law, that of the hadith, that it still points back to following the Quran alone. So the first hadith we're going to be looking at is from Sahih Muslim 2362. And all the hadith I'm going to be citing are either going to be from Sahih Muslim or Sahih Bukhari, the two most eminent compilations of hadith. So in this hadith, it reads that the messenger came to Medina and the people had been grafting the trees. And these are of uh, date palms. He said, what are you doing? They said, we are grafting them. Whereupon he said, it may perhaps be good for you if you do not do that. So they abandoned the practice and the date palms began to yield less fruit. They made a mention of it to the prophet, whereupon he said, I am a human being, so when I command you about a thing pertaining to religion, do accept it. And when I command you about a thing out of my own personal opinion, keep it in mind that I am a human being. So in this hadith, it's stating that the prophet was only a human being, that he was giving bad advice to the people and he was actually telling them, don't follow this if it goes against your better judgment. The next is to show that even in the matters of religion, the Prophet occasionally made mistakes. So this is Sahih Muslim 572. It reads, The Messenger of Allah led us in five rakahs of prayer. We said, O Messenger of Allah, has the prayer been extended? He said, What is the matter? They said, You have said five rakahs. He, the Prophet, said, Verily, I am a human being like you. I remember as you remember, and I forget just as you forget. So this shows that, again, if they didn't call out the Prophet and ask him in this matter, they would have potentially created an innovation in the religion. And this brings us to the third hadith, that Muhammad's judgment was valuable. So this is in Sahih Bukhari 7169. It reads, Allah's Messenger said, I am only a human being, and you people come to me with your cases. And it may be that one of you can present his case eloquently, in a more convincing way than another. And I give my verdict according to what I hear. So if I ever judge by error and give the right of a brother to his other brother, then he, the latter, should not take it, for I am giving him only a piece of the fire. So this is a clear indication that even in the matters of judgment, where he was commissioned as God's messenger, that his judgment might be in error. And that even then, individuals have to use their better judgment if he makes an error in this regard. So the next hadith, which is number four in the list, is regarding Muhammad's judgment that it came from the Quran alone. And this is in Sahih Bukhari 2155. It reads that the Prophet got up and glorified Allah as he deserved and then said, Why do some people impose conditions which are not present in Allah's book? Whoever imposes such a condition as it is not in Allah's laws, then that condition is invalid even if he imposes 100 conditions, for Allah's conditions are more binding and reliable. So again, the Prophet is calling on the book of God, the Quran, for the determination of the laws. He's not saying those who in essence uh, make conditions by what I said. He's going back to the source, which is the very book that God gave him to make judgment by. The fifth point is Muhammad prohibited writing anything from him besides the Quran. 
and it reads in Sahih Muslim 3004. Allah's Messenger said, Do not write down anything from me. And he who wrote down anything from me except the Quran, he should erase it and tell me, and not he be blamed. But he who attributed any falsehood to me, and uh, the narrator says, I think he also said deliberately, he should in fact find his abode in the hellfire. Now, this is a very interesting statement here. The Prophet is prohibiting anyone from writing anything from him aside from the Quran. And he's commanding the companions to erase anything that he wrote. But in addition, he's saying that anyone who attributes falsehood to the uh, Prophet, that he'll have his abode in hellfire. Now, this is considered one of the most mutawatir statements from the Prophet. The irony is, even in this most mutawatir statement, this mass transmitted statement, that there's so many narrations of him saying this, they don't know if the word deliberate was in the statement or not. Half the narrations say that anyone who makes any lie against the Prophet, irrespective if it's deliberate or not, will find their abode in the hellfire. And the other half have the word deliberate in the narration. And this shows the fallibility of Hadith. And it also shows that even at the time of the Prophet, the companions were fabricating false narrations to him. Again, giving us indication that the Hadith aren't to be accepted as a source of law. The sixth point is that the best people are those who focus on the Quran alone. And this comes from Sahih Bukhari 5028. It reads that the Prophet said, The most superior among you Muslims are those who learn the Quran and teach it. Notice again, there is no mention of Hadith and Sunnah. That if you want to be the best among the Muslims, according to this Hadith, is that you have to learn the Quran and to teach it. You know, ironically, this does not say memorize the Quran. It means to learn it, to understand it. Today, what do people do in mass? They go and they memorize the Quran, but they have no clue what it is that they're actually stating. The seventh point is that the companions were not allowed to ask about the Quran to the Prophet. And this is in Sahih Muslim 12b. It reads, it is narrated on the authority of Thabit that Anas said, we were forbidden in the Holy Quran that we should ask about anything from the Messenger of Allah. So they were not allowed to question the, uh, the, the Prophet regarding the narration. And this shows that the Prophet was not there to go and provide tafsir about the Quran. That's a reason that you do not find in any of the Hadith corpus a tafsir of the Quran. What you find is the supposed circumstantial events around what transpired when these verses were revealed. But even then, these supposed uh, contextual uh, hadith, uh, they constantly conflict with one another and they contradict one another. So this again shows that the sole duty of the messenger, as echoed numerous times in the Quran, was the delivery of the Quran alone and not the dissemination of hadith and sunnah. And this is further confirmed in the next point. This is number eight. This is what the Prophet supposedly recommended to do when two people deferred in interpretation of the Quran. And this is Sahih Bukhari 7364. It reads, Allah's Messenger said, Recite and study the Quran as long as you are in agreement as to its interpretation and meanings. But when you have differences regarding its interpretation and meanings, then you should stop reciting it. Notice, again, it doesn't say that if you have a difference of interpretation, go and consult the Hadith, the Sunnah, go and figure out what the Prophet said regarding this matter. No. He's telling, again, the followers, the companions, that they are to stick with the Quran alone. That at the right time, God will give them the correct understanding. And again, this is echoed in the Quran. It says, do not rush into uttering the Quran until it is revealed to you. And say, my Lord, increase my knowledge. This is Surah 20, verse 114. So up until this point, we've seen the fallibility of the Prophet according to the Sunnah. We see that the, uh, the Sunnah points towards the Quran alone. And now we're going to see that the Sunnah also rejects Hadith by name. So this is the ninth Hadith. This is Sahih Muslim 867. And it says that the Prophet said, The best of the speech is embodied in the book of Allah. And the word here for speech is Hadith. And the best guidance is the guidance given to Muhammad. And the most evil commands are its narrators of hadith. And every innovation is in error. So here we have, in essence, the first shot where it's saying 
that the best hadith is the Quran. And this even corresponds with Surah 39, verse 23 of the Quran. But it goes further to say that the most evil commands are the narrators of hadith. And it's calling them out by name and saying in every innovation, there is an error. So it's showing the viewpoint of the Prophet towards the transmitters and narrators of hadith. And it is not in a positive light. And this continues. In the 10th point, we see that Muhammad warned against the spreading of everything one hears. In Sahih Muslim 5, it reads, The Messenger of Allah said, It is enough of a lie for a man to narrate, and this word for narrate, again, is hadith, everything he hears. So here, again, we're getting the sentiment of the Prophet towards those who are transmitting hadith that we see that he condemned them from writing anything from him aside from Quran. And now we're seeing that he's saying individuals who are narrating everything they hear are liars. And it gets worse. This is Sahih Bukhari 2697. And we see that Muhammad is advising the rejection of Hadith. It reads, it says, Allah's Messenger said, if somebody innovates, and again, this word that they translate as innovate is hadith, something which is not in harmony with the principles of our religion, that thing is rejected. And this goes completely against both Shafi and Hanbali, who in essence claim that the Quran is either on par to the uh, hadith, and then Hanbali who made the claim that the Quran needs the sunnah more than the sunnah needs the Quran. Because it's saying that in essence, we are to abide by the Quran. That is the standard by which we are to judge. And this brings us to the 12th point, where Muhammad warned against spreading of hadith. And in this narration from Muslim number 30, uh, we read about a certain statement that the Prophet shared with a companion. And the companion asked, he said to the messenger, should I then give the tidings of this good news to the people? He, the Prophet, said, Do not tell them this good news, for they would trust in it alone. This is informing us that, again, we do not take the Hadith as a source of law. The, the Prophet is consistently pointing back to the Quran and is advising against the sharing of Hadith because he didn't want the people to trust in the Hadith alone. And in the 13th point, we see that Muhammad warned against narrators of Hadith. And this is Sahih Muslim 6. It reads, as the Messenger of God said, There will be in the last of my nation a people narrating, and again, this word for narr narrating is hadith, to you what you and nor your forefathers heard. So beware of them. So here in very clear language, it's warning people for upholding, let alone spreading of hadith. And it's warning them that it's going to happen. People are going to be spreading hadith about the Prophet that have no validity, that no one has ever heard. And the prophet in this narration is saying, beware of them. And this takes us to the 14th point. The Hadith states that Hadith narrators will not be saved on the day of resurrection. And you'll see numerous narrations about this. This one specifically is from Bukhari number 6582. It reads, the prophet said, some of my companions will come to meet me at my lake fount. And this is in the, the hereafter. And after I recognize them, they will then be taken away from me, whereupon I will say, my companions. Then it will be said, you do not know what they narrated in the religion after you. So the people that the Prophet is not going to be able to supposedly save, according to this hadith, are the ones who narrated in the religion after his passing. And this brings us to the 15th point. The only thing the Prophet left his people was the Quran alone. And this is Sahih Bukhari 5019, where someone is asking Ibn Abbas, it says, Did the Prophet leave anything besides the Quran? He replied, He did not leave anything except what is between the two bindings of the Quran. Then we visited Muhammad bin al Hanafiya and asked him the same question. He replied, The Prophet did not leave except what is between the bindings of the Quran. So here we have two companions apparently being asked, did the Prophet leave anything? And the response is no, it's only what is in the bindings of this Quran. And we see a similar narration in Sahih Bukhari 3047, that the only wahi, the only divine revelation left by the Prophet again was the Quran alone. 
So the, the individual says, I asked Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, do you have any divine revelation, wahi, that was not included in the Quran? He said, by the one who split the seed and created the soul, I have no knowledge of it, again, the wahi, except that which Allah may grant to a person from the Quran. Then it, it cites this other thing. It says, and what is in this sheet of paper? So right now we're seeing that the only wahi, the only divine revelation that the companions had of the Prophet was the Quran alone. And then it references this piece of paper. And we did an entire episode regarding this piece of paper, but it's worth uh, uh, touching base on this because this is the 17th point. So what does this paper write? If we look at Sahih Bukhari 1870, and there's about like a you know dozen of these narrations uh, regarding what this paper wrote, this one is the most comprehensive. It reads, The sacred city that is between Ayr and such and such, whoever he narrates therein a hadith or sheltered a propagator of hadith, then upon him is the curse of God, the angels, and all the people. Not he will accept from him an excuse and not a ransom. And he said the responsibility of the Muslim is one. Then whoever he violated his responsibility with a Muslim, then upon him is the curse of God, the angels, and all the people. Not he will accept from him an excuse and not a ransom. And whoever he turned away a people without the permission of his master, then upon him is the curse of God, the angels, and all the people. Not he will accept from him an excuse and not a ransom. So this piece of paper, this supposed piece of paper, is condemning the creation and the spreading of hadith. And it's saying that such a person who does this, or even houses a person who does this, is condemned by God, the angels, and the knowledgeable. And this is kind of like the movie Fight Club, where you have the three rules of Fight Club. The first rule is you don't talk about Fight Club. The second rule is you don't talk about Fight Club. So this hadith works kind of in the same manner. Ali's being asked, do you have any other divine revelation beside the Quran? He says, no, we only have the Quran and what's written in this paper. And what is written in that paper is that anyone who creates or uh, propagates or houses someone who has hadith is condemned by God, the angels, and the knowledgeable. So this is a double whammy that we should not be fooling hadith beside the Quran. And this takes us to the 18th point, which is a very interesting narration. And it shows that the companions didn't even want a hadith left by the Prophet aside from the Quran alone. It reads, this is Sahih Bukhari 7366. When the time of death of the Prophet approached, while there were some men in the house, and among them was Umar bin al-Khattab, the Prophet said, come near, let me write for you a writing after which you will never go astray. So here is the Prophet saying, I will write for you something that will never lead you astray. And you know what the companion's response was? It says, Omar said, the prophet is seriously ill and you have the Quran, so Allah's book is sufficient for us. This clearly shows the sentiment of the companions that Omar, one of the closest companions to the prophet, when was offered to be given something directly from the prophet, a writing that if he got, he would never be led astray. His response was, that the Quran is sufficient for us. And this reminds me of when Jesus asked the companions, who are my supporters? They did not say, Jesus, we are your supporters. They said, we are God's supporters. Because this was potentially a test for them, that if they don't want to go to stray, they have to stick with the Quran alone. And this brings us to the final point that I want to bring up. This is the 19th point, that the companions themselves rejected the dissemination of Hadith. And this is Sahih Muslim, Number 19, for the 19th point, it reads, Ibn Abbas said to him, Indeed, we used to narrate from the Messenger of Allah when one would not lie upon him. However, when the people began fabricating hadith, we ceased to narrate from him. And this hymn is in reference to the Prophet, that they stopped narrating these hadith because they were seeing for themselves what was happening. This also corresponds with the historical account. Because we see the first collection of hadith, the oldest ones we have, are from Imam Malik, which was written 150 years after the death of the Prophet. The collections of Bukhari and Muslim and the Sita came 250 years after the death of the Prophet. This is the reason we don't see any formal arrangement by the companions to preserve the supposed Sunnah. There was no effort 
in the sense of memorizing these and passing these down in a diligent manner. Because as we see, this practice was frowned upon. But there is something that the Prophet gave his life to. There is something that the companions treasured more than anything else. And that one thing is the Quran alone. This is our only source of law that we are to uphold for this religion. These fabricators of Hadith only confuse the religion and have caused billions to go astray. I'm going to end by reading some verses. This is uh, Surah 39 starting from verse 23 and I'm going to read God willing to verse 38. God has revealed herein the best Hadith, a book that is consistent and points out both ways to heaven and hell. The skins of those who reverence their Lord cringe therefrom. Then their skins and their hearts soften up for God's message. Such is God's guidance. He bestows it upon whomever He wills. As for those sent astray by God, nothing can guide them. What is better than saving one's face from the terrible retribution on the day of resurrection? The transgressors will be told, taste the consequences of what you earned. Others before them have disbelieved, and consequently the retribution afflicted them whence they never expected. God has condemned them to humiliation in this life, and the retribution in the hereafter will be far worse if they only knew. And it continues in 39.27, it says, We have cited for the people every kind of example in this Quran, that they may take heed, an Arabic Quran without any ambiguity, that they may be righteous. God cites the example of a man who deals with disputing partners. This is equivalent to Hadith. Compared to a man who deals with one consistent source. This is the Quran. Are they the same? Praise be to God. Most of them do not know. And then God gives us this warning. It says in 39.30, it says, You, Muhammad, will surely die, just like they will die. On the day of resurrection before your Lord, you people will feud with one another. Who is more evil than one who attributes lies to God while disbelieving in the truth that has come to him? Is hell not a just requital for the disbelievers? As for those who promote the truth, the truth is this Quran, and believe therein they are the righteous. They will get everything they wish at their Lord, such is the reward for the righteous. God remits their sinful works and rewards them generously for their good works. Then in 3936, it asks the most profound question. It says, is God not sufficient for his servant? They frighten you with the idols they set up beside him. Whomever God sends astray, nothing can guide him. And whomever God guides, nothing can send him astray. Is God not Almighty Avenger? And I'm going to end with this last verse, 39:38, And it shows that these people think they're being guided. It states, if you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they will say, God. Say, why then do you set up idols beside God? If God willed any adversity from me, can they relieve such an adversity? And if he willed any blessing for me, can they prevent such a blessing? Say, God is sufficient for me. In him the trusters shall trust. I don't believe in any hadith beside the Quran. If you want to look at it for historical accounts, at best what you can say is these are the discussions that we're having when the compilation of these hadith took place. So if you want to understand what was taking place in the year 850, you know, 250 years after the death of the Prophet, yeah, you can go and look at hadith. But to try to use hadith as a source of law is something that is condemned by God, the angels, and the knowledgeable. And something that we should never do because God gave us the perfect book, which is the Quran alone. God willing, we're going to end there. If you guys want to get in contact, please join our Discord server. We have a thriving community of believers, daily discussions, and going into depth on the verses of God in the Quran. If you want to follow along the verses of the Quran, please download the Quran Study app on the iOS App Store. If you don't have an iOS device, you can go to QuranStudyApp.com. And if you're looking for more content, you can go to Quran Talk blog, where not only you can find additional content, you can find references to all these hadith in the corresponding article. And until next time, peace and God bless.